following is a paid program, and the views expressed on this show do not represent the views of WJZ FM, CBS Radio, its sponsors, or affiliates. This is Planning with a Purpose with your host, Brian Akers, certified financial planner and founder of Akers Financial Group. Now, bringing personal financial planning to the lives of our listeners and clients, one person at a time, here's Brian Akers. Good morning and welcome to Planning with a Purpose. I'm Brian Akers, Certified Financial Planner, Akers Financial Group, with offices in Forest Hill and Lutherville, Maryland. Welcome to our show. And today I have a very special guest. We flew him in from Indianapolis, um, Thomas Harden. He um, came in to talk at our expo on Friday, and he's here with us today to go over the markets and his portfolio and the process that he loves to do. So good morning, Tom. Good morning, Brian. Enjoyed the trip, the expo. Expo was just uh, incredible. Did a great job as usual. Yeah, thanks for speaking. Um, we did have you pretty busy that day. Uh, today, I'm keep you busy again. Um, I want you to be able to go over how the market's doing, how the stock market is, uh, what you think about the roller coaster we've had since January 1st, and uh, what indicators you see that are out there. Uh, now, Tom's been on before. Um, if you ever want to go to our website at acresfinancial.com, that's A-K-E-R-S-F-I-N-A-N-C-I-L.com, you can get more information. You can see our, our radio tab there, and underneath there you can see all of our recorded shows. You'll see Tom has been here before. One of the things that I'm going to say today is that you can actually hear him talk about the volatility of the market that was coming and you can almost um, hear him be a prophet, which I thought was pretty good. Um, so welcome back to our show. Um, this is a recorded show, so we can't accept any um, phone calls today. But um, we, uh, we do want you to sit back, listen a little bit. If you do have questions, you can call the offices at 410-692-9870. And like always, our goal is for you to understand that we want to teach you a process, not a product. That process is financial planning that takes your financial fingerprint and leads to financial decisions that you need to make. And to be able to sit down with us and have a free hour of our time, you just call us at 410-692-9870. All right, Tom, so what do you think of the market this year? Well, it's been an interesting year. Um, Markets, uh, as we've talked about before, are driven by supply and demand. And they tend to have different environments. Uh, We have bullish environments, which tend to have uh, low volatility. The price kind of, it puts in a high and then pulls back higher, high, higher, low, kind of a stair-step pattern. And then you have uh, bearish or transitional environments, which are always uh, more volatile. And you begin to see bigger swings. I mean, some of the biggest up days and uh, the biggest uh, returns over a month or two will happen in the middle of a bear market. We just had kind of a uh, kickback rally that's lasted for about the last uh, 50 days or so for about 15%. Mm -hmm. And that's normal. That's not typical of a bull market. That tends to happen in bear markets. So So when mm -hmm. you say that it's typical in a bear market, that means we're not out of a bear market. That means this is um, all the tendencies of a bear market. Yeah, we still have the tendencies of a bear market. Uh, It changed uh, around August uh, 20th, 21st, when we saw that. Uh, a sharp drop in the decline. I don't know if you remember, there was a Monday in August where the market just got clobbered. Yeah, it was like my mother's birthday. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Then there was about four days in a row. And then ever since then, uh, there's no question that the climate is different than it was before. Uh, Before, it was very stable, just, Mm -hmm. you know, as I said, higher highs and higher lows. And after that, we saw, you know, a very sharp decline, followed by a big advance that Mm -hmm. was double digit, then another decline, and another advance. So uh, right now, it looks like the market's starting to turn back down just a little bit. But, you know, I think the real key thing is not so much what is the market doing. It's, it's kind of why is it doing what it's doing in terms of uh, supply and demand? And what can we do to maintain stability in a portfolio? We definitely don't want these kinds of swings to occur in our portfolio. And that's kind of a, a closed system, the portfolio mm-hmm. itself, which you right. can manage in the markets. Are, right. And that portfolio, which you're the manager of, is called Canterbury Thermostat. He, um, Tom Harden is one of our third-party money managers. We take um, the separately managed accounts for a fee. Um, that fee um, through my organization is 1.95%. I earn part of it, and then Tom earns part of it, managing mm-hmm. the money on the day-to-day basis. And his job is to take the money we set up in an account for him, and he trades based on these indicators and these market, uh, the market um, that you see that's out there. And then you make trades, and those trades are building a portfolio of ETFs, 
exchange traded funds, and you're able to then build a portfolio out based on what you see. Now you're talking about stability, so you're designing portfolios so that no matter what the volatility is in the market today, that you're actually able to maintain their wealth and maybe not take as big a down as the market might take us? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the technology in every industry is just, you know, it's, it's been incredible. Uh, the problem is, is that technology really needs applications to, mon- you know, to manage it. Uh, when new technologies and, like you said, exchange-traded funds, it gives capabilities to invest in things that we could have never even thought about before. When those first become available, it creates uh, a lot of confusion. And then eventually the applications begin to catch up, which allow us to benefit from everything that they can do. So before, you know, it's if you had a bear market, uh, you just pretty much had to take it. But now there's a number of securities, ETFs, that actually benefit from bear stock markets. So uh, again, since securities are liquid, they're supposed to be managed. They mm-hmm. fluctuate. They have bull and bear markets, always have right. and always will. And uh, the key is to have the processes to be able to maintain a, you know, a stable and consistent portfolio. And that requires uh, a process. Let's talk a little bit about, you said uh, it benefits from the bear market. So an ETF that bear benefits from the bear market, that would be the short position ETFs? Uh, yeah, they have uh, inverse mm-hmm. ETFs, which we won't get into an explanation. But if, if mm-hmm. uh, you have the S&P 500 goes down 5%, sure. the inverse goes up 5%. It's a mirror image of the underlying uh, index. Uh, now we can actually own currencies mm-hmm. as in the form of an ETF on the New York Stock Exchange, Japanese yen, euro. Uh, you could own commodities. You could, be, uh, you could be inverse oil. You could be inverse bonds. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's any number of uh, instruments that we can own that will behave differently from the, from the U.S. stock market. Right. So what I try to do for my clients is we divide their money up. We have money that has a zero risk to it. We have money that um, has um, a little bit of risk. We have money that's designed for dividend and income. And then we have our growth, growth and income portfolios. And what I do is I put your Canterbury portfolio in that category of growth, growth and income. And what I try to present it as is a portfolio that's designed for growth, but around um, the stability and a reduced volatility compared to the market. Now, that reduced volatility, you're graded on a technical way through a thing called beta, where your comparison to the market um, movements of up and down. And Mm -hmm. so what you're trying to get at is through trading and watching the market where it is, you're able to to reduce risk compared to just staying in the market and being long the market. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, basically what we're saying is is that um, there are a lot of investment strategies. Some are for growth, some are income, some are right. for... There's a lot various, out there. Thousands, there's a, thousands there's, to choose from. Exactly. Right. And they all tend to go in and out of favor. Yes. Uh, what we're focused on is a portfolio strategy. So we'll use uh, a universe of maybe 200 plus ETFs, they'll either relate to uh, the equity markets, global equity markets, and then we'll have some that are alternatives to the global equity markets. And uh, it's our primary job to be able to maintain what we would call uh, the optimal portfolio. We want to keep the most efficient portfolio, the one with the highest, uh, highest return and lowest risk. And that efficient portfolio is a moving target. I mean, the, the best portfolio today looks a lot different than it did prior to August. Right. Um, so what would change since August? Say last August, we were in a shorter-term bull market because the market from mm-hmm. 09 had really uh, done incredibly well through the end of 14. And then 2014, 15 was moving up and down, but still going up a little bit. Um, what really changed in August last year? Well, I think, um, you know, obviously two, uh, 2013 was a really good year. Yes, huge. And then uh, 2014 and 15, what we began to see is the different segments of the global market started falling off. A global, you know, if we took, global meaning like um, uh, Global meaning uh, it could be countries like an index, uh, yeah. like uh, what's called the EFA, European Australian Far East Index. Right. There's emerging markets. There's countries, uh, different sectors. Um, industries. And what we began to see was what we call the breadth 
of the market began to kind of diminish. And as we got into uh, last year, it was really being carried by five, six, ten of the very largest capitalized companies. And that was it. And that was it. And it's, right. you, you can kind of use a little kind of a battle analogy in that you want all the troops out in front and the generals in the back directing everything while all the troops had headed over the hills. Right. And then you had the, the real large cap stocks uh, uh, up front. Now you're beginning to see those fall off. Uh, probably right. one of the best examples is Apple Computer, which right. could be considered to be its own sector, really. But uh, <laughs> Apple Computer now is uh, off 20% plus. Right. And it, from um, its high, and they had um, sales go down, which I don't think that's ever heard of at Apple, at least not recent yeah. recent decades. Um, but the hard part is to maintain a certain growth level consistently to the future, because um, investment people think it should always grow straight up and never go down. Now, when um, the market it went down and back up in January, so 2016, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we started the month of January was horrible for the for the index, the S and P 500, the Dow really got hit hard. And then mid-February start to come back again. Um, is there a way to know what change that triggered the, the, the borderline recovery there? Or uh, what do you think? Uh, if you, basically, you can go in reverse. You can actually see what happened. But what, do you, what, what can you describe as what happened at that time? Well, America? markets uh, have varying degrees of, uh, again, efficiency. There's the yeah. efficient market theory. And uh, they say that markets are always efficient. And since they're driven by supply and demand and people drive supply and demand, we have varying degrees of rationality at a given point in time. So uh, it was interesting as we uh, began to go into January, you had probably the worst January in history. Uh, But markets uh, tend to do the opposite of what the majority of the people think. So uh, after that 13% plus correction, then it did what no one would expect, and that is rebound. Uh, But a rebound like that is just, it's really basically market noise. If you have an inefficient portfolio, it can do virtually anything. Uh, You know, in a bull market or a bull market environment, as we would identify it, a normal correction, Mm -hmm. which would be defined as a bull market correction, is about 10 percent, 8 to 12 percent. And that's the market-specific risk. There's nothing we can do about it. You can't diversify it. It just Mm -hmm. is there. So we want to keep the portfolio in a bull market kind of an environment where our risk is limited to you know eight ten twelve percent and uh, this year and since August it's just it's it's bear market <laughs> right. bear market environment which means it can go up down sideways and uh, it could drop thirty forty percent or you could see a big rally like we just saw All right so when you have downside so when you see the possible going down like in January it went down thirteen percent mm-hmm. in a portfolio that at a Canterbury when I put money inv- invested for my clients at Canterbury. What I want to see in the worst case months, I want to see very low on the downside. Right. And I saw that this January, though very, very well through that. Um, and then I saw you sort of hold on through that period, and then it transitioned back up, um, and then you've still been holding on. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess you're holding on because you're, you're ca- using the word noise, calling it's just normal noise, even though it seems very emotional with a couple thousand points sure. on the Dow. Um, that's not that large of a move anymore, 2,000 points. That's less than 10%. Well, I, th- I think you have to look at Start where the leadership more. came from as well, Brian. I mean, uh, this market has been primarily carried by the things that were the absolute worst before. You know, basic materials, energy, finan- you know, financials to some degree. So, uh, again, it could have been in reverse. You could have had the best January and then the worst February. Right. So what we want to do is just keep the portfolio stable when the market's inefficient. Right. That's very true. Now, at Acres Financial Group, what we try to do is we try to take where you are, which we call it your financial fingerprint, and we look at your situation, how you're investing your money, and then we look at what's out there when it comes to investment advisors, third-party money managers, um, annuities, insurance, savings. Uh, we try to bring this all together where we do a financial plan. That financial plan is designed around you, around your financial fingerprint, which is where you start. And then we build this financial planning process designed in writing for you and your family. If you ever would like a second opinion or would like to talk more about your own situation, you can give us a call at 410-692-9870 or you can go to our website at acresfinancial.com and just um, respond there and we'll get back to you right away to schedule that free initial appointment. Stay tuned for more of Playing With a Purpose right after these messages. 
Welcome back to Planning with a Purpose. Call 410-583-1057 now to begin your plan. Once again, Brian Akers. Welcome back to Planning with a Purpose. I'm Brian Akers, and here with me today, like uh, we said last segment, is Tom Harden, um, Canterbury Thermostat. He's a third-party money manager. So far, we've been talking about the, the market itself and the volatility since January. Um, to me, there seems to be a disconnect between high quality companies and the and the market, the way it swings, and sometimes I just don't understand the emotions of what's going on in the market. Um, at your company, when you're managing money for my clients, how do you view this, and how do you try to explain it to everyone that's out there? Well, Brian, you've hit on a really important point, and that is there is definitely a disconnect between companies and stocks, or really. Uh, any underlying asset in a traded financial security that's liquid. And, you know, I think a lot of people would be surprised to know that if you took uh, the S&P 500 companies, the major corporations in America, and you just looked at their earnings and their profits, the corporate profits, uh, most people wouldn't know that, that the aggregate group of major U.S. corporations have never lost money, ever. All right, let's, let's stop there. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're saying the S&P 500, which is 500 different companies, mm-hmm. um, if we go back and take as a whole, not not just every one company, but as a whole, yeah. they've never lost they money. They have never lost money. As a matter of fact, Brian, they've kept records going back to 1871. Okay. The major corporations in the United States, in terms of their, their corporate profits, right. have never lost money in any given year, ever. As a whole. As a whole. I mean, there's, going, whole, there's going to there's be a company that, sure. that, that fails and dies out. But, right. But when you take the bad one in with all, everybody else, yeah. they're they're doing fine. Right. Robert Schiller's done studies on that sure. from Yale, and it's it's, it's an interesting point. Now, and you have to look at the stocks, of course. Right. But if you take, take just that point, <laughs> does that mean we should just buy the S&P index and forget about it? Well, it, it, it is interesting that it would seem like the companies make money, the stocks should also make money. Right. But uh, the S&P 500 since 1871 has had 39 down years. Uh, some interesting statistics on both, actually. Uh, companies, uh, and we uh, Warren Buffett looks at what they call earnings yield, which is the opposite of the price-earnings ratio. Yeah. Warren Buffett's so the big investor. that um, He just had his big um, Berkshire Hathaway meeting. It's mm-hmm. online if you ever want to watch it. It's interesting to listen to. Yeah, he's an expert at companies. Yes. And his favorite company is uh, uh, IBM. Uh, but but basically, if we look at if we go back to your point, sorry to get off track, uh, the best year in corporate earnings or earnings yield was 18.82% for the aggregate of the major corporations. Uh, the worst trailing 12 months was um, about two-tenths of a percent. The average has been 744 And you say, well, it sounds pretty good. Mm-hmm. It never lost money. Average about 7.5%. But if we look at the S&P 500, what we'll find is a big spread in returns. I mean, uh, the best years are all, they're really up a lot. You know, like 1933, if anybody had money left in 1933, it's up about 57%. Right. Uh, 34, the next year is up 55, 56%, and 49%. But on the other hand, the bad years are pretty bad. They're down, you know, 45, hmm. 40%. Right. And the problem is, as I'm sure you've, you've covered num- a number of times on the show, is if you have a year where the market drops 45 or 50%, it's going to take about 100% to get back to break even. <laughs> so if right. we take these outliers of the biggest up years and the biggest down years, you're nowhere near being back to break even. Mm -hmm. So again, to kind of summarize this, Brian, uh, companies are driven by their profits, their profits and their earnings, whereas the underlying stocks are driven by supply and demand. Companies are not liquid. Securities are liquid. So they're driven by two, two totally different things. All right. Say that one more time. You said um, securities are liquid? Traded securities, they're traded all day long, right. so they will fluctuate based on supply and demand. And that's because we can be in it and we can be out. So there's day traders in and out, they're, yeah, they're trading for whatever reason they want to. Um, not, usually it's based on momentum, 
not always on earnings or true profit or yeah, true return. Yeah, and, and that's short term. That, right. that would be kind of noise. But over the long run, some people begin to figure things out before others. And as they do, they react. That gets picked up in the way the security mm-hmm. trades. And then eventually there's either good news or bad news. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember um, – uh, Reuters, I think, had 28 or 29 oil analysts, and they asked him at the end of last year, uh, at the end of the year before uh, 2014, what they thought oil prices would be at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. They said about $100, and they were right for about six months. Yeah. Uh, not many thought that oil would go below $30 yeah. uh, a barrel, and it did. So it's very hard to project out that way. But what we can do is identify the types of characteristics of securities that would go up, which is primarily low volatility, the more under accumulation than distribution, and then hold those because bull markets are really more predictive of risk than they are returns. We don't know what's going to be the next uh, Apple computer and, and run up, uh, what, what we can uh, have the best control over is the risk side. And if we can limit the risk and then hold securities that have these bull market characteristics and eventually it averages out and mm-hmm. you get a good return. Right. Uh, I'm just I was listening to that and I'm trying to think, well, I'm out there listening to this show. I hear you talk about the markets like this and I wonder, well, should I own stocks? Should I own an individual stock based on what you just said? Should I own a mutual fund? which is a combination of stocks, or should I just own an index? Um, What does this mean when it comes down to how do I take my money and go out and invest it, um, and how should I try to invest money that I want to try to grow over time? Well, a lot's changed, Brian, uh, you know, as you well know. I mean, historically, markets, uh, you know, we looked at risk driving return. People believe that risk, the more risk you take, the more return you can get and the more time that it takes to average out. Uh, Investor risk tolerance, how much tolerance do you have for pain? How long do you want to take it? Um, You know, buy and hold and rebalance. So what you do is you have a pie chart, you diversify the pie chart based on your your subjective uh, risk tolerance, and then you just kind of hold it. And that really doesn't make a lot of sense because every asset class or any type of investment that you would be in has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, The advantage of a corporation or owning a company is if it makes profit, you make money. If it loses money, then you have to put money back in. Uh, Whereas with securities, they're liquid and good years are really good. You can make a lot of money, but you can't take the bad years. You have to know the difference between a bullish and a bearish environment. If you can't do that, then you really probably shouldn't be in the markets. Or not that the individual would know that, but if you don't have a portfolio strategy that can control or manage risk, uh, then it's, it's a pretty tough you know, you have to really hope for a bull market to make money, in other words. Right. Well, what you're saying there, the thing you said was buy, hold, rebalance. And what I think about is what they're pushing everybody's 401k, 457, 403b into. They're pushing that everyone should have a lifetime or a target date fund that's built around asset, and then they rebalance every quarter, every six months. And the concept behind it is – you have stock portion, a bond portion. Every year you get closer to retirement, you add more of the bonds, which is supposed to be the safety part. They don't look at the economy. They don't look at the bear or bull market. It's just allocation, strict allocation without any look at any look at what's going on with them day-to-day in market environment it's at all. So we have this large push um, to have target date lifetime funds being the answer Um, for people to put it and just forget about it, Um, buy, hold, and it rebalances. Rebalances where your portfolio will buy and sell. It'll sell the high ones and and buy the low ones. Um, Sometimes when it buys the low, you have to think, well, there's a reason something's low. And guess what? Maybe there's a good reason it's low. Maybe you shouldn't be buying it. But what what you're saying when talking about the market is that this approach that we're taking with the third-party money management by Canterbury Thermostat is that we're managing money in a way that's looking at the market as a bull or bear market, taking lower risk when it comes to the overall approach by 
by on purpose monitoring where we stand economically. Is that fair to say? Well, where we stand in terms of the rationality of the markets. I think sure. the best analogy is, of course, a thermostat. I mean, uh, the approach we talked about before was uh, a pie chart highly diversified, and the pieces of the pie don't move. I mean, you can probably add some more, but once you cut the pie, you've cut the pie. So that would be kind of like having a, uh, a thermostat that's stuck Right. Where we would say in Baltimore, the average temperature is 55 degrees, so just give me 15 degrees of hot air all the time, and I'll hit my average of 70 that I want. And we know that that doesn't work. So uh, it takes a process, it takes an application uh, that's testable, that's systematic for a thermostat to work, which is what you're probably more familiar with. And if you think about, again, markets fluctuating and have bull and bear periods and, and all the different asset classes we have today, we need something very similar to be able to manage to keep the volatility consistent like we'd want to keep the indoor temperature consistent. Low volatility or decreasing volatility is a primary bullish um, bullish um, principle or bullish um, uh, mm -hmm. characteristic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when it comes down to investing and um, they, we want to put money with Canterbury Thermostat and we're trying to compare to a target date fund or lifetime mm -hmm. fund, mm -hmm. what's the difference in your mind? Well, I think one of the differences is they're signing a risk label to an asset class. So what they're saying is bonds are safer than, than other instruments. And uh, I, I go back a ways, Brian. I remember uh, in the late 70s and the early 80s when I thought bonds went down every year because interest rates go up every causes <laughs> bonds to go down. Yep. And, um, you know, we'll have a period at some point in time. Uh, these cycles sometimes run 25, 30, 40 years. But interest rates can't go much lower than where they are right now. And if we take – I think the best example, uh, Brian, would be 2013. Uh, that year, if you took the TLT, which is the 20-year exchange-traded fund, um, basically that, that had a drawdown, peak-to-trough decline of about 17 18 percent, wow. and it was down for the year. Fairly high volatility, where the S&P 500's uh, ETF – uh, never had a decline from peak to trough more than about 8%. It was up 30%. Right. So in that environment, we would say the, uh, the S&P 500 had less risk and was a more conservative investment than the Treasury bonds. Right. Um, since the early 80s, when interest rates sort of hit their high, we've had an incredible environment where um, interest rates have been going down, which adds value to your bonds, and you get paid the interest. Now we've hit the interest rates being so low that we get very little on the interest side. And in my opinion, in the next five to 10 years, um, zero to negative on the value side. So when we look at the, the transition in a target date fund or a lifetime fund, where they're buying more and more bonds every year in a portfolio, um, what they're doing to me is adding more risk than they ever, ever want to when it comes to a design of the asset portfolio. I just don't see it being proper in this exact environment. Yeah. No, I, I think you nailed it there. I mean, with bonds, it's either a win-win or a lose-lose. If you're lucky enough to buy bonds when rates are high and they come down, your bond actually appreciates and you lock in a higher rate. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you buy when interest rates are low, you lock in a low rate. Right. And as future rates go higher, your bond drops. You're, dream so, uh, you're sitting there dreaming about what I wish I could exactly. have. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been a good talk so far. Um, Canterbury Thermostat is a third-party money manager that we use at Acres Financial Group. All you need to do is you call our office at 410-692-9870, and we can provide more information on portfolio managers like this. As we build out a portfolio for our clients, we um, enjoy using different money managers, and Tom Harden's one of our one of the ones that we do use. Uh, we welcome you back in a few minutes um, of more of Planning with a Purpose. Welcome back to Planning with a Purpose. Call 410-583-1057 now to begin your plan. Once again, Brian Akers. Welcome back to Planning with a Purpose. I'm Brian Akers here with Tom Harden. We are on the recorded show this week. We thank you for listening, but if you find out that you really got to find more answers, you need more information, you can go to our website at akersfinancial.com, A-K-E-R-S, 
F-I-N-A-N-C-I-A-L.com. Or you can give our office a call at 410-692-9870. If you can hear our voice on 105.7, we will be able to work with you. Uh, we are licensed in multiple states throughout this region and throughout the country. We can work with you with my team of advisors, and we look forward to hearing from you and to talk more about your financial fingerprint, where you are currently. Today, by talking to Tom Harden, we're talking about the markets, the investment idea a little bit when it comes to strategy. The main concept we're trying to get across today is how we manage our money matters. Um, I was talking to Tom here a second ago. We are talking about a, a quote by Warren Buffett. I was wondering if you could give us that quote. Oh, sure, Brian. I think Warren Buffett's known for uh, his quotes and his funny uh, quips. And uh, one that sounds pretty logical is uh, uh, if the company does well, then the stock will eventually follow. And that that sounds reasonable. Yeah, sounds reasonable. It sounds really good. And, you know, I think this is uh, we can use an example. Uh, There is maybe a little disconnect there. I, I know that his favorite, if not his favorite, one of his very favorite companies is IBM. Well, the one that he doesn't own yet. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but he, he loves IBM, and IBM is an incredible company, and uh, he likes to use a formula called earnings yield, which we discussed a little earlier. That would be the company's earnings divided by the price of the stock. It's the opposite of a PE ratio. Uh, and if you take IBM's uh, earnings yield for 2013, they made 7.9%. The next year, even better, about 10.1%. And then the year after that, last year, 109 consistently more money, uh, that, and they've been very profitable. So that's top-line earnings? Uh, this is what their earnings yield is. Earnings yield, okay. Yes, earnings yield. Sure. Um, which is published, you can get it at Zach's in a number of places. So, wow, I mean, th- that's great. I would love to make that kind of money. Uh, let's take another example. Uh, let's take Tesla. Sure. Uh, Tesla actually hasn't made money in the last few years as far as the company. As a matter of fact, in 2013, Tesla lost about $74 million. Okay. So if you owned a company, you'd have to come up with another 74 probably to replace that. Uh, the next year, they lost even more, about uh, almost $300 million, about $294 million. Mm. And then last year, they lost $888 million dollars, almost a billion dollars. Now, wow. Brian, if you want if you were going to own a company outright, what would you rather own? IBM or Tesla? Um, you see like fundamental based on the numbers you just said, I'd say IBM. <laughs> yeah. Based on potential and what could possibly happen, I'd probably be like a cheerleader on the on the stock market where it's like Tesla's low, 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 let's go ahead and buy it while it's down. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, you would think that. Well, let's look at the stocks for a minute. You know, if the companies do well, the stock should follow. Right. Uh, IBM in 2013, even though they made money, their stock dropped a little over 24%. So, and that's with the S&P 500 up like 30 for the year. So that was what, what year, 2013? 2013. So their earnings yields up. Yeah, they made money, they made but the money. stock goes down. And the stock went down 24%. Yeah, substantial. So that would be an entire disconnect between valuation and performance of the company. Well, yeah, but you'd think, well, it's going to work itself out. So, so, you know, I mean, there's a disconnect, but it'll work itself out. Would you call that profit-taking? <clears throat> would you? Well, it's just uh, one's driven by <laughs> their profits, the other's driven by supply and demand. Yeah. So, well, the next year they made more money, okay. as you know, so that should be a good thing. Well, the stock dropped uh, a little over 12% in 2014. And then they made even more money in 2015 as a company, but the stock dropped another 11%. (laughs) Now, what about Tesla? Uh, Tesla, um, believe it or not, in 2013, they were up like 570% Okay. with losing money. Then they lose more money, and the stock goes up 47 48%. And then last year, they were up 7.9%. Now, how do you explain that? I mean, that's three years, maybe. As a matter of fact, Warren Buffett had a, another uh, quote, and I'm going to paraphrase this, but this should be pretty close. And it says that if you can't handle uh, losing or seeing your stock holdings drop by 50% and not become panic-ridden, okay. then you shouldn't be in the market. Wow. 
<laughs> and his favorite holding period is, quote, my, my favorite holding time is forever. Well, if you own a company, that makes a lot of sense. You know, companies aren't liquid. You want to hold your company and get the profits. But securities are driven by supply and demand. And if you buy and hold those, you'll hold through bear and bull markets. Maybe eventually IBM will go up. But as it stands right now, it looks like you'd be about 60 cents or so on the dollar after three years. <laughs> so, so if we were buying a stock, yeah. um, it sounds like Tesla is way overvalued based on earnings. And, but IBM is way undervalued. Well, what we're interested in is what's happening now. We're not interested about whether it's overvalued, undervalued, markets are efficient, it's priced wherever it is. Okay. Uh, and I'm not saying that, you know, that one should have bought Tesla. What I'm saying is, mm. is that it's not even about the securities, Brian. It's about the portfolio. Yeah. We have to control risk in the portfolio. And if you can't control the risk, you can't control the outcome. And if your portfolio drops more than 8, 12, in my opinion, a 15% decline is a failure in risk management. You can recover from that. But again, you know, the, you have bull markets and bear markets. We need to know the difference. Take each security and look at it as if it were its own asset class. Each security mm -hmm. will have bullish and bearish characteristics at different times. So they'll all run through the full cycle. Of a of the movement, but most people are very emotional with their investments. They're watching the the ups and the downs. Um, we we do the opposite uh, of whatever we should be doing because of our emotions. So how do we manage? Like you're managing portfolios and you're managing the money, and it sounds opposite of our emotions. It sounds opposite of what people are doing, um, and I guess basically. How do you explain that? Yeah, <laughs> therein lies the big problem <laughs> in that uh, supply and demand is counterintuitive. If everyone's optimistic and they have high expectations, they've probably already invested their money and they're hoping for it to go up at a fast rate. No one left to buy, only a lot of people left to be disappointed and to sell. On the other hand, if everyone thinks it's going down, it's interesting, 1933 and 34 were the two biggest years, and those weren't particularly good years for the, uh, for the economy. So the idea that uh, markets are counterintuitive has kind of led a lot of the academics and different money managers to say just buy and hold because if you try to make adjustments, you're more inclined uh, to make the whole thing worse and do the opposite. But what's happened now, Brian, is now that we have technologies and systems and uh, processes, um, we, we've kind of gotten to the point where we can do evidence-based portfolio strategy, where we can develop applications that can monitor, uh, you know, not only the markets, but you can, you can monitor your asset allocations, your diversification, your security selection, and you can create efficient portfolios. And then that's something that will adjust and change over time and kind of move in concert with the markets. And uh, again, with the complexity that we have today, we really need uh, a system to be able to manage as opposed to just kind of going by our gut feelings uh, or a loose art form, which is what it's been in the past. Right. So this is just a style of investing where you take the evidence that's out there, the, the places that we put our money, how we position it, how we set up the asset allocation, how you invest that money is not the, the average, normal, um, reactive way it's always been going. You, uh, over the last um, 16, 17 years now, you've been mm -hmm. having this portfolio? Yeah. Um, yeah. You've designed a way to watch the market itself and then have a lower volatility in the market and try to capture as the market moves and keep what we have when things are terrible and then grow when it's time to grow. Yeah, I think to summarize this whole thing, Brian, is uh, that – Portfolio management kind of started with asset allocation, which was driven, again, by your, uh, your investment objective, your risk tolerance. And then you had diversification, and then you had your security selection, and then you put it together as a portfolio, and they used to rebalance it. What we're saying is those four pieces need to be connected, mm -hmm. and they need to be variable. 
There are certain times when a 60-40 portfolio is too conservative. There's other times when it's not. So we want all these pieces to communicate in the same way that a thermostat would monitor temperature and direct the furnace and the air conditioner to maintain stability in the room. The thermostat is reacting to what is happening, the reality of what's happening. It's not actually predicting what's going to happen. Now, when I, as a financial planner, and I'm sitting down with a client, we're getting ready to retire, um, we are positioning money, and we want to have money that's in the market where we can capture some of that gain and growth over time. We want to keep liquidity with our money. And the reason I, I like using portfolio managers is that it's always liquid and that we can get in or out whenever we like. We can have the money managed by someone actively. And so what it helps my clients do is know that that money is being watched over and we know that we're going to be okay by letting it, it grow and be actively managed in positions. What I mean by positions is you actually position us between U.S. market, between global, between different types of indexes that are out there. So you provide a diversification that really, really does help me in my planning. And that's why I choose your portfolio management firm. Um, how do you do that? Like, um, how do you know to be in global or not to be in global? What's your well, basic I, idea? Uh, I think instead of really getting to how we do it, I think that the key word, and you mentioned about four or five times, is management. Right. I mean, uh, if you own a corporation, you don't worry about the liquidity of the company in terms of whether you can buy it or sell it today or tomorrow. Uh, what makes a company successful or not is the management. You know, they have to manage their inventory, their sales, and uh, manufacturing, et cetera. And if their management is good, then the company should do well. Uh, the same thing is true with portfolio management. They don't call it portfolio finance, finance, and they don't call it, you know, portfolio economics. It's a management question. These pieces move. So as a result, we have to manage that movement and maintain the most efficient portfolio to match the environment. Seems like a lot of portfolios are, should be called forget about it, and yeah. that they buy things and just forget about it. They don't. They don't manage it. Yeah, um, um, you, that'd be like buying a company and yeah. not managing it. Just forget about it. It just owns some things and <laughs> let it go. Yeah, uh, and that's for me as a financial planner. We put money. We all save our money for the future, and we want to know what's the best place to put it. Where should we put our money? Now, portfolios like this don't have zero risk. They have some risk. Um, through the ability of the portfolio management firm and Tom Harden and his group, they're able to reduce the risk, to reduce the volatility. And that's, that's what I need when it comes down to um, portfolio managers for my retired clients as they're trying to grow that money to last a lifetime, to be able to have income that's sustainable, that's reliable, that we can have inflation-adjusted um, income in the future. We have to have portfolios tied to the market where we can capture the, the good years and not get destroyed by the bad years. Um, thank you very much, Tom, for coming in today and going over some thoughts and processes that you do. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, I'm a big fan of yours, as you well know, and I've uh, I always enjoy coming to Baltimore and uh, end our conversations. Yeah, thanks for uh, speaking at our expo. Oh, we thank for, thanks to everyone who came to the retirement expo on Friday. Um, today is on uh, May the first, and I want to wish happy birthday to my sister Suzanne. I also want to welcome any of you that are listening. Want to find out, and, and if you want to find out more information about our money management ideas, at Canterbury Thermoset, on portfolio management about Acres Financial, you can give us a call at 410-692-9870. Thank you for listening today. I'm off to church. Hope you are too. You've been listening to Planning with a Purpose with your host, Brian Akers of Acres Financial Group. Brian Akers of Acres Financial Group is a registered representative offering securities through Kalos Capital, Inc. and investment advisory services through Kalos Management, Inc. Akers Financial Group is not an affiliate or subsidiary of Kalos Capital or Kalos Management and does not provide tax and legal services. Advice given on planning for a purpose is general in nature and one should seek further advice from their financial advisor, broker, attorney, or tax accountant before investing. Be sure to read each prospectus carefully to understand all the risks associated with each investment. 